Today is Monday, July 5th, 2010, at Chippen Zurich Bible School. Our brother Matt Norton will be speaking to us on the subject of the life of Lot. The first class is entitled Separation. Thanks, Eric. Well, guys, how are we all? Really good? How, how, do you have Uncle Bob this morning? How was he? Was he? He's got a lot of energy, hasn't he, for an older man? It's unbelievable. Now, were you guys at that little intro we had the other night when yeah, I told you about my kids? No? It's not about the kids. I just want to know if you're at the intro. No? Who's heard a study on Lot before? Nobody. Perfect. As I said to the adults, it doesn't make these studies special in any way, but what it makes them is interesting because it's not a subject that you often hear much about, the life of Lot, okay? Simple as that. Because who do we normally study? Abraham. Abraham Abraham gets all the front page headlines. Lot, you know, who is he? Was he even there? And we sing that hymn, Lot the Faithful, and I actually think we do our minds a little bit of disservice because in my head I had a Sunday school version of Lot. This is Lot, okay? I imagine him walking down the street of Sodom, down the main street, getting tomatoes and rotten fruit fruit thrown at him the whole time because he was there like a freelance prophet saying, condemned Sodom, you guys are sinners, God's going to judge this place. It was nothing of the sort. So if that's what you had a picture of when you were at um, Sunday school, I submit to you up front, it's wrong. I had that too. But the reason why it's changed is simply because I studied a little bit more in depth. And the reason why, did I tell you the story of how I studied Lot in the first place? I think I did. I won't tell you that story because it's irrelevant. It's a good story though. That's the problem with stories. The, The ability to try and make them relevant to what you're saying most of the time. Now, okay, Lot. Did we have a remote? Did you say we had a remote? We did? This one here. Right there. Have I got the wrong one? Doesn't matter. I can walk over and go like this. Okay, now, with Lot, okay, he, you think about this. What chapters of the Bible do we know about Lot? Not all at once, okay? You're not allowed to be embarrassed. I mean, I have to stand up in front of you, don't I? That's how embarrassing it is for me up here. It's terrible. So you guys can answer some questions. I promise, you know, I'm not going to say, that's a stupid question. Where I answer, rather, how do you even think of that? I mean, I might. See how we go. Genesis 14. Genesis 14. What else? Genesis 11. Yep, 11. 19. No. 12 and 13, he's there. Then he's in, he's in chap, like chapter 14, like you said, when he's with Kate or Leomi. He's in chapter 19. And between the lines in chapter 18, because Abraham's there interceding for him, pleading for Lot. So he's in a lot of chapters. Oh, is he in the New Testament at all? Does anybody know of any chapters in the New Testament where we can find Lot? Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Bzzz. Because he's not in Hebrews 11. Woo! That's all right. I paid him to do that. I paid him to do that one. Thank you. He's not in Hebrews 11. He's in other chapters. He's in Hebrews 13. That's what you meant. He's in Hebrews 13. It's a good answer. What other chapters is he in? He is in... Drum roll, please. Luke 17, as it was in the days of Lot, yeah? And he's also in that chapter which talks about just Lot, 2 Peter 2. Okay, so he's in those chapters, but I want to show you something about Lot which you may not have known, and we've got to go through this quickly because it's now, you know the silly thing? I have looked on my wrist about 30 times for the time. I've never worn a watch in my life, but I've gone like this 30 times the last two days. What time is it, Brother Bob, and what time do I have to sit down? Okay. 
Okay, so I've got to finish. Big pardon? Okay, but is that in 25 minutes' time or is that in 45 minutes? Okay. Now, I'll show you this. Look at this. Hebrews uh, chapter 13 of Genesis. Just have a look at that. He's disrespectful and he's selfish and unforgiving. You know what he does? He has a fight with Abraham. He has a big argument with his, basically like his father. Somebody who's taken him on and treated him like a son. He has a a fight with him and he refuses to say, I'm sorry. And he takes front line and chooses for himself selfishly. This is Lot, the faithful Lot. Does anybody else, hands up anybody, once in your life have you ever been disrespectful? Just once. You're bad, all of you are bad. It's true, isn't it? But does that mean you're not righteous? You have your good days and bad days, your good moments and your bad moments. Your whole life you're aiming for perfection. You're trying to get there, but you keep falling flat in your face. So that's not unusual. I just think for you young people, you have to know in your mind, because I think for young people when they look at characters in the Bible, sometimes they think it's unusual for a character in the Bible to have a fault, to do something wrong. They're all perfect. And woe is me, because I could never be that perfect. Lot wasn't always perfect and he certainly wasn't born perfect. I'm glad he wasn't born perfect because if he was perfect and I thought I had to make it up to his grade, I'd be over there in that corner in fetal position sucking my thumb. It'd be too hard. See, chapter 14, look at this. Abraham saves him from Kedorlaomer. He actually puts his life on the line to save Lot and Lot is ungrateful and waves goodbye to Uncle Abraham and goes back to Sodom again. What is he thinking? He should have stayed there with Uncle Abraham and Melchizedek and got his life back together, put it all back together, but he didn't. It's ungrateful and he's weak, couldn't say no. Chapter 19, chapter 19 is when Lot actually finally shines right at the end, but in chapter 19, he's still, do you have the word dilly-dallying? That's the first thing that came to my head just then. He's dilly-dallying around. He, the angels grabbed hold of his hands and placed him outside the gates of the city and said, go! And Lot goes, oh, I don't want to scary up there, up in the hills. I don't want to go up there. I'll get, I'll get bitten by an animal. Can't I go down to Zor, this little city here? Can I go there? And he starts to neg- Like The angel has physically taken him out of the city and offered him salvation and still he's negotiating the details. Let's get this right first. I don't want to go, uh, can we go here? What are you thinking, Lot? And do you know I believe in that little moment, we all know the story, don't we, how he's negotiating. I believe in that moment that his wife, as he's reluctant and stalling, his wife actually has time to go, hey, what am I doing? I've got to get out of here. I'm not going up there. I'm staying here in Sodom. And I believe that Lot, through his reluctance, actually causes the death of his wife. You think about that, guys. As you young fellows start to become leaders and have to make decisions in your life, you've got to be firm and solid. You can't be dilly-dallying around. Oh, will I? What's best for me? You've got to think, what's best for her? What's best for my family? What's best for the truth? Lot's got some problems. And I feel sorry for him. If he hadn't have waited, if he had, the angel had have let go of him and said, now go, if he had have said, come on, love, let's go, as quick as he could, maybe she wouldn't have had time to even think about the things that she left behind and all the things she missed out on. I don't know. Have you thought about that? So Lot is righteous and I, I, I think it strikes a blow for reality, the study on Lot, because you are Lot and Lot is you. I am Lot and Lot is me. And being too harsh on him and just saying bad, 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 bad lot would be like sitting on a branch and on the trunk side of it starting to saw it off. Right? Because you're condemning yourself. I'm condemning me. So when I study lot and I actually present him to you, believe it or not, this is what I'm like. I have been like. I don't want to be like. I see him there as holding up a mirror. I go, oh, I don't like the look of that. As you can well understand. Now, who's his dad? Who's Lot's dad? I've got, some, I've got an overhead here for you. Does anybody know? Well, who was Abraham's brothers first? There was Abraham. Who was Abraham's father? Let's start off on the easy one. We'll, go, we'll roll it right back. 
Tira, Terra, American, which is this. Like, I've got to do Philemon tonight, but I've been told it's Philemon. Tira's cool. Tira is Abraham's dad. Now, Abraham had two other brothers. Who were they? Nahor and Haran. Now, what happened to poor old Haran? Oh, by the way, who was Haran's dad? Tira. So, I'm just tr- tricking you. You've got to get on the boil here. Who was, who was Haran's son? Just have a wild stab at it. Yeah, Lot. Check this out. Now, um, I think Lot's righteous at the end of the record, okay? So I'm putting that up there. Towards the end of his life, like Samson, like Manasseh, like um, Judah. Samson had problems all through his life. I'm not saying his whole motivation was wrong. I'm not saying all Lot's motivation was wrong. But they kept making bad choices. And it's at the end they start to shine. Like Uncle um, Bob was talking about the glow at the end. Now, here is a classic uh, genealogy. But is anybody here good with numbers? Anybody here who wants to be an accountant when they get older? Because this is the genealogy for you. Okay? I'm not an accountant. I just put that genealogy in for those who need the details. Uncle Bob likes the details. But if you're like me, we made a simpler one. Okay? So we can follow it easy. This is Abraham's family. Now have a think about this. So they all come out of Ur of the Chaldees. But get this. He's dead. Haran dies. Lot's fatherless. Nahor, he didn't care about Lot. Nahor basically, I read, you know, you could, you can have a, I don't care if you have a discrepancy with this, you can say, no, Matt, I, I disagree. That's fine. This is the way I read. Nahor doesn't care about anybody but himself. They leave Ur, they get to Haran. Nahor says, I'm staying here. He doesn't go any further. In fact, does anybody know what Nahor's name actually means? Uh, what? It means a snorer. If, who would call their kid the snorer? He must have been a good baby. That's all I can say. It's like Eglon. You know what his name means? A fat cow. Imagine mum. And she's holding him and the husband says, Oh, darling, isn't he wonderful? What do we call him? She goes, oh, Hardly hold I'm going to call him a fat cow. <laughs> It's just hilarious. I can't believe it. But anyway, Nahor is a snorer and Abraham can, can hardly get him out of bed. Come on, we've got to leave Ur. And angels appear to me. We're going to an unknown land. Nahor rubs his eyes and says, all right, I'll come with you. He gets to Haran and says, no further. I'm not going any further at all. And Abraham can't get him out of bed when he hears the, the call the second time saying, let's go. Nahor says, no, I'm staying here. Now, Abraham, I believe, has taken on Lot. I'm just trying to fill you in a bit of details. Abraham loves Lot and he provides something that Abraham can't have in his family because Sarah's barren, is that right? Sarah can't have any kids. And I believe Abraham sees this, and I'm not saying he's a little baby, he's a full-grown man, but he's still fatherless. And for somebody to take him on and to offer him now a, 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 a position of sonship, I will be your father and you can be my son. Abraham takes Lot to himself and actually starts to prepare Lot to become the heir of all his effects. His whole house is going to give it to Lot. He's like his son in the faith, just like Paul had Timothy and Titus as his sons in the faith. So it's really important that we just see this picture. So they leave Ur of the Chaldees, they get down into the land. Where's the first place they come to? after Haran, as they're walking. They still don't know where they're going. They're walking around going, this is nice land, I'd like to live here. How about this land? That's nice over there. Finally, God says, this is it. This is the land. At what town was that? In this awkward silence, I'm just going to go and have a bit of water. Which one did Uncle Bob use? Okay. Just checking. So what was my question? I've forgotten. The first place they came to. What was it? Oh, 
bingo. You have so totally redeemed yourself. It comes to Shechem. Look at this. What's Shechem all about? Well, Shechem, believe it or not, is a, um, is a place of decisions. It means between the shoulders, the burden. So if I give you a burden, say, here, carry this for me. In the old days, you put it on your shoulders and you go, and you start to walk. Now, it becomes a place where the burden is, you have to make a decision. That's the symbol of Shechem. And there's always the, the decision to be made. In this place, it's a classic, the decision has to be made is, are we going to be like the Canaanites? Because it says, if you just want to open your Bibles up, please, to Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis 12, it says there, when they get to Shechem, it says, and I quote, that at that time, the Canaanites, in verse 6, were in the land. The Canaanites were in the land. He builds an altar. God says, this is it. Surprise. This is the land. And it says the Canaanites are there. Now, what do you think the decision is that he has to make? And I believe it's this. We're not going to be like them. We're not going to follow after their gods. We're not going to live with them. We're going to keep away from that crowd. And he backs away. And in verse 8, it says, they move to the hill country on the east of Bethel And he pitches his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east and he builds an altar to Yahweh and he calls upon the name of Yahweh and the name of the Lord. Now what does he do between Bethel and Ai that he doesn't do at Shechem? What does he do? Are you sure? Does he not build an altar at Shechem? So he's built an altar at Shechem and he builds an altar at, between Bethel and Ai. He does something else between Bethel and Ai, which he doesn't do before this. What's the record say, guys? He pitches his tent and something else. He calls on the name of the Lord. Now think about this. In the scripture, what does it mean to pitch a tent? Does anyone know? If you're in the scripture and you're a tent pitcher, you're a tenter, you're camping all the time, does that mean you're always on holidays? No. So what does it mean in the Bible when you're a tenter? And you don't have a firm place of residence like in a city. A sojourner, exactly, thank you. You're a sojourner, you're a pilgrim. In those days, in that time, in Genesis, a person who lived in a tent was a Christadelphian. That's the way it worked. There were, there were, look, there were exceptions, but generally speaking, the faithful lived in tents. Abraham lived in tents. Lot um, lived in tents for a time. Isaac lived in tents. Jacob lived in tents. You might think, why did they get themselves an apartment somewhere? It's because they're standing aside. They're being Christadelphians. They're living the life outside of the city, lurking for a city that was to come, searching for something better God was going to give. And Abraham says, I'm not pitching my tent at Shechem. I'm not going to be like them. He gets over to between Bethel and Ai, and what he does is basically, he tells all the caravan that's with him, I don't know how many people were there, but you can imagine Abraham having some sort of ceremony. He get together and he says, right, everyone put your tents up. We're stopping here for a while. Well, can I ask a question? You, down there. And Abraham says, what do you want? And the little kid asks a question. We just come from Shechem. It was between a beautiful little, it was in a valley there. It was a lovely spot. How come we didn't stay there? Abraham says, because we're not going to live with the Canaanites. We want to get as far away from them as possible. And people say, but they're still sort of around here. And Abraham says, I know they are, but we're not going to live like them. In fact, this is what we're going to live like. And he calls on the name of the Lord. Does anybody here know what it means to call on the name of the Lord? Have any of you guys called on the name of the Lord? That sounds rather evangelical, I know. You know, all I've got to do is just call on God's name. Just call on the name of the Lord. I've been saved for 20 years. Have you ever spoken to evangelicals like that? That's what they think. 
You know, you just ask Jesus to come into your heart, and He will. And He's going to save you. I've heard them. They do it in Australia, they do all this. Yeah, I called upon the name of the Lord. Yep, 30 years ago. I've been saved since then. That's how they do it in Australia. Is that what calling on the name of the Lord means? There's no way it does. So what does it mean? What is the name of Yahweh? Tell me what the name of Yahweh is or, or, or speaks of. His character. Okay, guys, I want you to give me adjectives that describe the character of God, characteristics that tell, tell us about the name of God. Tell me what they are. What's our God like? You guys all worship this God. I'm not going to help you out here. You've got to tell me because you should know what this God's like like this. He's a jealous God. Merciful. He's omnipotent. Loving. Forgiving. Gracious, exactly, thank you. Merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. He's holy, just, righteous. All these things. And Abraham would have expounded this. This is the God who we worship. That's the name that we're going to call upon ourselves. And the little kid that always asks the questions down the front would have said, Uncle Abraham, what, what does it mean we're going to call upon the name of the Lord? Abraham says, well, it means his name is going to become us. We're going to become like him. That's the character that matters. We're going to become just like this God. Our God, Abra- our God, Abraham would have said, was our God's going to make us like himself. And the little kid at the front always asks the question, well, how, how are the other, you know, the Canaanite gods different? Are they different to our God, Uncle Abraham? And Abraham would have said, yes, they're very different. The Canaanite gods that they worship are terrible. They're vengeful. They're lustful. They're envious and vacillating. Their gods are made by their own hands. Human hands. Humans, the Canaanites, make their gods to look like themselves and to suit themselves. There's a big word for that. Does anybody know what that's called? When the gods have human qualities? I'll I'll give it to you. This is the biggest word I've ever used in my life, okay? And I had to look it up. It's anthropomorphic. It's really incredible, isn't it? It just means like man. Okay, so the gods of the Canaanites were like men. But our God, see, our God, we're like him. He makes us like him. We're not naturally merciful and long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. But God's going to make us like that. In fact, in fact, this is the Old Testament like to being baptised. Does anybody know the quote? where it says, Arise and be baptised. Why tarriest thou, arise and be baptised, calling on the name of the Lord? Who knows where that quote is? Because this is what Abraham was basically doing. He's telling them all, we're drawing a line in the sand and this is what our life is now about. We're going to follow Christ. We're going to follow Yahweh. This is the God we're going to be like. And all the caravan would have standing ovation. They would have been pumped up. Going, yes, this is where we want to go. That's our God. We're for him. That's the characteristic I want to have. It's a far better way to go. And they would have been so pumped at that and excited. It's in Acts chapter 22. Let's have a look. So Acts chapter 22... <coughs> And we read in verse uh, 16. Somebody. Somebody have a crack at that. Again, not all at once. Yep, go. Exactly. And if you're taking notes... And it's good to take notes, young people. It's very good to take notes. As we say at home, you, you can't take notes without kneecaps, okay? You can't walk without kneecaps. I know, it's a pretty bad gag, but I want you to take notes. Okay, it's important. I walk out this door and you go, you ask, get asked the question, now what did he speak on? Speak on? Did we even have a talk? You guys will forget. Acts 22.16, <coughs> Acts 2.21 where it also says calling on the name of the Lord. And it says it in Romans 
So mark those down. It was a public acknowledgement of life direction. It was a psychological cementing in the, for the nature of this travelling group. This is what we're going to be like. And everyone was just jumping around and us, so excited and happy about this. Yes, we're going to serve this God. Let's go. Now, as soon as you say you're going to serve God and you promise to serve him with all your heart, mind, soul and strength, what happens to your life? What does God do for you? It feels sometimes like somebody unscrews the, the wheel nuts holding the wheels on the wagon on. He will send what? What will he do? Has anybody ever heard of trials? Hands up if you've heard of trials. Okay, that's good. Trials. He's going to send trials in our life. And that's nothing to be, you go, whoa, what's this? That was a surprise. I didn't expect that. Trials are natural. Trials are going to come thick and fast. And God sends a trial in Abraham's life. And does anybody know what the trial was that he sent? Famine. So he goes to the cupboard and the cupboard's bare. There's nothing there. No food. Now, can you imagine what it would be like to be Abraham? You have to look after this group of people. They're your, you have to account for them and you're responsible for them. And you can't provide food. And the little kid who always asks the questions down there, oh, Abraham, I'm hungry. And Abraham looks down at him and he's usually annoyed because he asks so many questions. But now his heart goes out to him and he's feeling really sorry for him. He thinks, I want to get some food for him. Now Abraham decides... Because everybody's clamouring. What are we going to do? The God who you're meant to be worshipping, we're worshipping, we haven't got any food. How is this possible? Abraham decides to go into Egypt. Now, I've got a question for you. Was going into Egypt right or wrong? Hands up who thinks it's right of Abraham to go into Egypt. Hands up who thinks it's wrong. Hands up who want to abstain. Hands up who haven't got arms. Now the thing is, I don't know why you're all so scared for. You're getting progressively even more scary to me as the time goes on. Now what happened was, Abraham shouldn't have gone into Egypt. It's not that it's wrong to go to Egypt because even the Lord Jesus Christ had to go to Egypt with Mary and Joseph, his parents. But why was it wrong for Abraham to go, do you think? He didn't pray about it. He didn't ask his heavenly father. He didn't say, Father, I am so super stressed. I don't know which way to go. You've told me to come to this land land flowing with milk and honey. It's meant to be good. There's nothing growing out of the ground. What am I going to do? God would have said, calm down. It's okay. I will provide. He may have said, go into Egypt. I don't know. But he didn't ask God. You're exactly right. Young people, what do you do when you've got a problem? What do you do? The first point of call before you do anything every day should be asking the Father. Every day. You should be praying. Every day. Think about it, guys. You should be on your knees asking, how do you know which way your life's going to go tomorrow? How do you know which way your life's going to go today? You don't know. And Abraham makes this choice and... It's just, it's so sad what happens because he goes down to Egypt. We know what happens. He tells a little lie, doesn't he? It's just a little lie. He tells a lie about Sarah being his wife. She's just my sister. And Pharaoh takes Sarah into his harem. And I don't know what you go, where you go with this, but... Out of gratefulness, because Pharaoh thinks she is gorgeous, she's so beautiful, he says, here, Abraham, have some donkeys and have some more donkeys and have some camels and oxen and all these herds and have silver and gold and all this money. How are you going to get out of this one? Because as the gifts are pouring in through the tent door, 
Abraham's guilt's getting worse and worse and the hole in which he is in is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. He can't get out. Not without a miracle, not without, without some divine intervention. He is in a hole. And who's watching all of this? Lot. Lot is watching it. You have to see it from Lot's point of view. You know what he's doing? Lot's actually getting his first lesson in Hypocrisy 101. He's watching, he's learning this. One, if you tell a lie and hide the truth, what happens to you? You get filthy rich. You think about it. That's what Lot's learning. That's the example faithful father Abraham's giving him. Abraham's not having a good day. He's having a down day. He's having a bad moment. Lot is learning, if I hide the truth, (laughs) and he's sitting in his little cave with that wicked laugh going, (laughs) I can get rich. A lot of money. Now, tuck that away in your mind because that'll come out in the next in, over the week. Also, what almost happens to Abraham in so many occasions similarly happens to Lot. It's amazing because here, although Abraham gets, when uh, uh, Pharaoh finds out he gets sent out of Egypt and his passport turned up and revoked, don't come back, it's dirty money. You'd think Pharaoh would take all his money back and say, it's my money, but Pharaoh doesn't. He doesn't want the money. He sends him out there and says, take your money with you. So Abraham still maintains the wealth. And by the skin of his teeth is saved and he almost lost his wife because of that decision. Does that ring a bell with anybody else in this record? Lot goes down to Sodom and he gets redeemed in chapter 14 by Abraham and he's got his wife there. But he decides to go back and he loses his wife. These choices have a huge impact in their lives and in the lives of of Lot, rather. It's a massive thing. Now, guys, you're all sitting there. And I know, how old are you? Like, is anyone 18? 18 or below, basically? Okay, you're in that age bracket. You know, the... Your life is full of promise. You've got all these choices ahead of you. You're all young and you're not old and crusty like me. And you think, you know, I'm glad I'm not like him anyway. But you you think to yourself, I have got all these wonderful choices and I can do whatever I want. Young people, take heed. Make good choices. Abraham had the choice between blessing and cursing. Between Ebal and Gerizim. He was between Ai and Bethel, between the house of God and ruin. Every single day of your life, those same choices arise. Every day. And you think, it's only a little choice. It's not going to matter. If I just make a small choice, it's not going to change my whole life. Young people, it's not the one small, insignificant, trivial choice that matters. It's the daily choices that we make, that will in the end incrementally make an unimaginable impact in your life. Huge impact. I'll give you an example. Lot's a good example of the choices he made, which you think, what's so bad about moving down to Sodom? There's nothing bad about that, shifting houses. But in the end, he just kept making these little choices till we have a picture of him with absolutely nothing. So there's this guy on a plane. And the plane's grounded. And he doesn't want to talk to the fella next to him because, I don't know, do you guys like chatting to people when you're on planes? I don't always like it. But he's punching the buttons on his computer, he's typing something away there, doing anything he can to distract himself, not to talk to him. And in the end, the laptop battery just dies, okay? So, whew, it's gone. And they're sitting there for that long and thinking, oh, man, how come this plane won't take off? And he thinks, I Okay, I'll talk to him. So he talks to the person next to him. He finds out he's an engineer. But not just any engineer. He's a flight engineer and he works for NASA. And he was in the flight control room when the Apollo 13 incident. Actually, and it's a true story, as opposed to some of my other ones. And he's right there. 
And he says, you're joking, that is so cool. I can't believe it. How dramatic was that? And he says, did they really say, you know, Houston, we have a problem? And he went, yeah, yeah, everyone asked me that. They said that really. Oh, man, that was so close, wasn't it? Because you guys only had, you know, a couple of chances. No, we only had one chance. We had one chance to burn the engines and send them back to Earth. And we had to make sure it was dead on target. And the guy said, well, you know, I know you say dead on target, but wouldn't have mattered, would it, if you were like one or two degrees off? And the guy nearly coughed up blood. He said, two degrees, two, two degrees off. <laughs> and he reached into his bag and he pulled out, you know, one of those rocket-fueled Casio 1000 calculators that you have to kickstart? He pulled this out of his bag and he started punching in the numbers and he said, look, I don't want to be, I just want to give you this distance from Earth to the moon. If we were two degrees out at burn, we would have missed the Earth by 11,000 miles, 17,000 kilometres for the Aussies, okay? 11,000 miles, that's a long way, isn't it? 11,000 miles, it was only two degrees. And you make the decision, young people, we're not going to go to the class tonight. Why not? I don't know, I've got other stuff to do. I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to go catch a game or, or go to the cinema or something, go catch a movie. It's only one little decision. Doesn't matter. What about the readings? Well, I'm too tired. I've got homework to do. What about, you know, praying with your brothers and sisters? Well, they can pray by themselves. You think about the little decisions, which if you make one of them, it's not going to make one iota of difference, but imperceptibly, if you continue to make these decisions over a long period of time, they will have, as I said, an unimaginable impact in your life. Huge. And you might wake up one day 17,000 kilometres off course and away from God and not even feeling like ever going to the meeting again and not even knowing why. You might know that if you get that far off course generally, you don't even ask yourself the question, what am I doing here off course? You don't even know you are off course. And Lot is about to get way off course. Are we going all right for time still? Okay. He's getting way off course. In fact... They get down there. They come back. Abraham's so sorry. Can you imagine him all the way out of Egypt saying to Sarah, I'm sorry, Sarah. Love, I love you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How do you make up with your wife like that? Like I've thought about it before. Like if I gave her a bouquet of flowers, would that make up for it? And a box of chocolates? It wouldn't make up for it, would it? It would take months to heal that breach in their marriage. Like he had just put her in the most dangerous situation. What about her virtue? What about her emotional well-being? The decision Abraham made just to save his own sorry skin. He gets back now, he comes back into the land and he's determined to make a difference. And they come to Shechem, uh, not to Shechem, sorry. They don't come to Shechem. No, sorry. They come to between Bethel and Ai. That's where they come to. And they make this great rebuilding of the altar and Abraham, again, has some sort of a ceremony where he calls on the name of the Lord and he probably, just imagine you go, I'm Abraham, you guys are all the caravan with me. And I say, look, I'm so sorry for what happened. I should never have done it. I should have, as you said, somebody, t- I should have called upon the name of the Lord before I went. I should have asked God. And what I've done to my wife is just despicable. I'm so sorry, Sarah, in front of all these people. I'm sorry for you to have seen that lot. You're bad, my bad example that I've given to you. He would have gave, given some ceremony like this. And said to everybody, we've got to serve God. Plus, they've also got all these Egyptian characters. Heaps of people. Who else came out of Egypt at this time? Who do we know? That's right. Hagar the Horrible comes out of Egypt at this time with them. And they all think, well, I've got this whole bundle of idols here. My Egyptian gods are good enough. And Abraham says, "Uh uh-uh, because the little kid at the front said, hang on, Abraham, they've got all these different gods. And Abraham said, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'll just now deal with that. That was next on the list anyway. You've got to bury them. Get rid of them. Put them all away. This is the God we worship. He's merciful, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. He's not like your Egyptian gods. We call upon this name. And they go from there. And it says, notice what the record says. And I'll just summarise what's going to happen now. Because in Genesis chapter... 13, if you'll notice, it says in verse 2 that Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and gold. What does it say about Lot? 
Does anybody read the next few verses on? It says, Abraham was very rich in livestock and in silver and gold. What does it say about Abraham? About Lot, rather. He was rich. Exactly. But what was he lacking? When when Lot raced over and looked in Abraham's bags, he saw herds and cattle and silver and gold. And when he took his own inventory and looked in his bags, what was he lacking? He goes, hey, I've got cattle and goods. He's got cattle and goods. But he's all, what's that shiny stuff there? He's got silver and gold. And he went and checked again because he liked the look of that. And he said, I haven't got any. There's a crack appearing in the record. Lot is a lover of silver, as we'll show later. And that's the first occasion where the word silver appears in your Bible and it's ringing bells. Lot sees it. Abraham doesn't notice because why would Lot see it? What sort of characteristic loves silver? What's the word for it? There's a special word. Lover of money. What's it mean? (laughs) Greedy, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. There's another word for it. Covetousness, covetousness. Thank you, covetousness. Lot was covetous, and you might say, "Oh, Matt, you're too hard on Lot." Just relax. We have this terminology in English called suspend disbelief. Have you ever heard of it? No. Okay. Well, you have now. Okay. Just you think I don't believe that? Well, just hold on. Just suspend all disbelief for one moment, just for the end of the week. And at the end of the week, if you ta- have taken on board the things we've discussed and you don't like it, just dismiss it, no problem. But just hold on. Lot's covetous and they've got a problem. And this becomes the catalyst for the conflict. Plus, my brother, Abraham, has changed from a just man in Lot's eyes to just a man. He was the chosen one. He was the faithful one. Everything was hinging on him. And now Lot's at him as the halo falls off Abraham's head and he says, he's nobody. He's nothing. Nothing at all. And things start to change in the um, the relationship between Abraham and Lot. And I haven't got time to, to finish this. So what I might do quickly is wrap it up by saying this is what they did Lot finds look at this Lot makes this decline in his life he fights with Abraham they choose to separate and leave and it's the most it's the saddest picture in the Bible as Lot turns his face away from Abraham his father in the faith and he starts to head down towards Sodom and he pitches his tent so that in the, mo- in the morning when he wakes up, it's like tunnel vision, looking down the barrel to Sodom. That's where his life's now going. He's got his whole direction off course and he's going down there towards Sodom. Abraham, it would have broken his heart to see his son in the faith walk away like that. But Abraham hasn't got control over that. They couldn't get on anymore. And it wasn't because there wasn't enough room There's not enough room. Sell a few of your sheep and herds. Get some money. The real issue was they couldn't get on together because Lot was covetous. His eyes were like cue balls and all he saw was dollar signs and that was what he was chasing after at this time in his life. And it's a sorry, sorry situation to see but um, that's the way it was. Are there any questions, guys? Because what I might do tomorrow is finish off a little bit more out of that. And then we'll come back and we'll, we'll have a little bit more of a look at our money and covetousness. But has anybody got any uh, questions? Yes. Uh, Romans 10, 13, was it? Yep. The next class begins at 11 o'clock. If everyone can be in their seats by about 